Hello all of you beautiful people, Jules here for WhatCulture.com, and you know what, making video games, it's bloody hard work. From start to finish, whether you're part of a team or a solo developer, there are so many things to create, test, break, test, and then test again that would make your head bloody spin. One can see the lengths that developers push themselves to in order to get their games to market in projects like Indie Game The Movie, in which making games comes at the detriment of the subject's mental and physical health. But these are stories of extreme effort, passion, and care. However, the industry at large doesn't seem to reflect this as a whole, and there are much more examples of laziness, apathy, and a lack of care for the product or its customers. And the examples on this descent into gaming hell aren't simple cases of bugs, glitches, and content that had to be cut for deadline reasons, but are pinpoint moments in which franchises, developers, and the community at large allowed lethargy to seep into the experience and ruin things for others. So let's take a look at times where those taking a more comfortable approach caused discomfort for others, as we dive down into another of the deadly gaming sins, and this time, it's Sloth. Number 7. Delivering broken games and making fans patch them as depressing as it is to acknowledge, most video games, be they AAA titles or bedroom-developed indie games, ship with bugs and glitches. Now, I know it's very easy to get up on the soapbox and deride each of these moments as being unacceptable, but I must step in quickly to state that programming, even on a basic level, which is far beyond anything I can do, is exceptionally tough, and I do believe that giving a little leeway here and there when a few strings of code is out of place at launch is definitely fair. However, what is completely unacceptable, and a huge example of sloth in the industry is when developers release games in a completely broken state under the guise of, well, we'll just fix it later. Especially when they fly the flag of early access as a means of delivering half-baked titles to the player base while charging them full price for the privilege. In cases like Batman Arkham Knight, Warner Brothers knew for months prior to the game's launch that there were game-breaking bugs for the PC version, but dropped the title anyway just to get that quick cash injection. And in countless other examples, we've seen the fans themselves have to step in to fix the issue. Dark Souls and its remaster, Red Dead Redemption 2, multiple Fallout and Elder Scroll games all have had day one patches provided by the community rather than the creators, and that is simply inexcusable. Because remember, we're paying for these experiences. Number 6. Annualized Sport Franchises as I have said many, many times over my years working within the industry, I simply cannot wrap my head around the sheer gall that certain sports franchises have in their approach to delivering content to their fans. Every single year, without fail, you will have your progress reset back to zero as a new installment comes out asking you to do everything all over again, and likely spend more real-life money doing so. That is utterly baffling to me. The state of the annualized sports sequel is reaching a point of parody now, and and its insistence to move into more predatory, microtransaction-riddled states means that it's crippling any chances it has of breaking free of the mold and trying anything new. The costs of licensing, the need to beat the previous installment's profits, mean that we are seeing a lack of innovation and a lack of resource investment to change aging graphic engines or gameplay mechanics. Hell, 2K are still using animations in their WWE games that were recorded for the PS2 titles. That is ridiculous. And darkly, the only hope is that this subsection of the industry will collapse in on itself, but the beautiful dream that EA and 2K have created for players seems to be a hard one to wake from. Number 5. Zelda CDI Games – All the Wrong Info the Philips CDI Zelda games truly are one of a kind. Never before or since has a series of titles taken such a well-known and beloved IP and botched it in so many bloody ridiculous ways. Now don't get me wrong, I'm always glad that they exist because I've never laughed quite so hard or recoiled so much thanks to these animations, but underneath this is a true example of gaming sloth if ever there was one. You see, at any point, Nintendo could have popped their heads in and said, uh, guys, it's rupees, not rubies, or maybe address the mirror of other problems that tear holes in the franchise's established plot, but they simply chose to take the payday and turn their attention elsewhere. And this happens so much that it's actually incredible. For example, take a glance over at the mobile gaming market and type in one of your favorite franchises and you will likely be met with a ton of low-effort, low-quality titles sporting that IP. The original license holders don't seem to care that these titles chip away at their own goodwill, but such is the case of sloth. It breeds apathy and a lack of motivation to stop the easy money coming in. Number 4. The Ubisoft Dilemma 
It's a pretty safe comment to make that complacency breeds laziness, and there truly hasn't been a much more complacent video game developer over the last few years than Ubisoft. While the majority of games they push out are well received, there's a shocking lack of evolution within the bunch. If we're being honest, every single Assassin's Creed game feels the same. With the same watchtower or equivalent ascension unlocking interest points in the map, the same parkour systems, and the same animations. Every Far Cry game utilizes the same formula of a charismatic evil villain drug trip segment, and freeform base takedowns. Hell, in the latter case, they've even reused a ton of assets and map locations between games to save on dev time, something that the community instantly noticed and became bored of. And if you look within the chain of command, you'll find the reason why this happens. Up until quite recently, all of your favorite IPs were being signed off by just a handful of people, meaning that any new ideas were being roadblocked by people who couldn't see the wood for the bloody trees. Thankfully, a much-needed shakeup has occurred since, but if Ubisoft is as slow to react to game innovation as it was removing higher-ups with their problematic sexual abuse claims against them, then we might be stuck with the same formula for a long old bloody while. Number 3. Pokemon – Coasting on Prior Success now, this might be a rather contentious entry, but please, hear me out. I adore the Pokemon franchise and have every single mainline entry in my collection, but there's been a worrying and noticeable trend that Game Freak really seems to be phoning it in as of late. For example, let's address the biggest Q fans in the room, Pokemon Sword and Shield, which really seems lacking when it came to using the Switch's expanded hardware. After witnessing the love and care put into every step of Breath of the Wild and Mario Odyssey, it was expected that Pokemon 2 would be able to knock it out of the pump when it came to immersion and aesthetics. After all, this is a beloved franchise and Nintendo are very keen to keep the series going whatever it costs. So why does it look so bad? Why were Pokemon pulled from this entry? Why does it seem like there's a general lack of polish across the board, with the only real innovation idea here being Pokemon Go Big Now? It's a shame to see a brilliant franchise rest on its laurels so much that it almost provides negative returns. While the core experience might still be brilliant, if Game Freak doesn't make the most out of the hardware that it's provided, it will see fans keeping their money in their rather comfy shorts. And listen, if you choose to defend Sword and Shield and somehow think the idea of less being somehow more is a good thing, what we must really start addressing is whether it's actually okay for a company to still be releasing two separate versions of what is essentially the same game but with minor differences. No one else would have the cheek to do that, so why is Game Freak getting a pass? Number 2. Every Asset Flip Game I mean, can you get any lazier than literally not making part or indeed all of your titles yourself? However, to be clear, I'm not talking about a company using a design here or there that was purchased from a site or freelancers, as sometimes in a game as massive as, say, Watch Dogs, you might find the need to source a really high-res and grubby-looking trash can from another creator over spending man-hours making your own. But what I'm talking about here are pure asset flips, weirdly making them actually sound a lot better than they are. These monstrosities flood marketplaces like Steam regularly, dragging the entire community down with them. Comprised almost entirely of assets not made by the developer, or even worse, stolen from others, and then thrown together with little rhyme or reason in the hopes somebody will be foolish enough to buy it, asset flips work on the principle of low effort, high volume output, basically spreading their shit against every wall possible and seeing what sticks. It's a horrible facet of the industry, and it's especially grim when you see the same assets used over and over again from developers who are claiming that their specific store-bought game is somehow better than others. Boo earns. And number one, E.T. for Atari. It might seem so very easy at this point to kick yet another rib off the dead horse that is Atari's E.T., but honestly, it's hard to find a bigger example of nearly every gaming sin encapsulated into just one title. While greed may indeed be front and center of this experience, seeing as Atari literally forced developer Howard Scott Warshaw to complete the game within a ridiculously short time frame, all so that they could hit that sweet holiday season payday, it was actually a decision brought on by Sloth that was this game's downfall. You see, while E.T. went on to be a catastrophic failure, it only did so thanks to the company refusing to learn from the mistakes that they made with the previous critical bomb for the system, Atari's Pac-Man. This was another rushed, lazy, and thoroughly soulless product that traded heavily on the goodwill of the IP and was met with critical lambasting at every possible level. However, the game sold well, and so to Atari, that was enough to consider it a win. Therefore, they carried on, stubborn and lazy in their mindset, believing that they could pull the 
same job with E.T., but oh how wrong they were, as this game's critical and commercial failure was the wake-up call this lazy giant needed. It's a shame that it seemed to take the whole bloody industry with it, though. And there we have it, my friends. That is actually the end of this seven deadly video game series. I really hope that you've enjoyed this. And even though we are looking at the darkest and most horrible aspects of an industry that we love and support so often, but still, you know what I mean. I hope you got some entertainment out of that. Let me know what you think about it down in the comments section below. It's been an absolute blast working on this. And if you'd like to see me carry this format over to say like the uh, the main channel, about talk about TV and film or over onto the horror channel and things like that, we can always do that. Just let me know what you'd like to tackle next, and I will endeavor to do my best to do so. Big love to each and every one of you. Thank you for supporting this little format, this little experiment. It's been a blast to make again, like I say. And uh, yeah, I hope to do more of them. But until then, take care of yourself. Big love from me to you. I'll speak to you soon. Peace out.